My name's Rob. I'm a case manager at uh, Toronto Rehab. And um, I've been there, believe it or not, next month is my 20 year anniversary. All right, believe it or not. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. They, they hired me when I was four, okay? <laughs> believe it or not, that's officially on the record. Um, so as a case manager, you know, I, I work with all the patients that come through the program. In particular now, I spend an awful lot of time working with uh, patients suffering from heart failure, what we call end-stage heart disease, um, and a lot of patients that have got transplants. We've got about 15 heart transplant patients on the program. So that's where I tend to spend most of my time. Take Charge has been a passion of mine. We started this 10 years ago with a group of patients that uh, graduated off from a Monday night class and this June is going to be our, our 100th session so we've been doing this for quite some time all right so it's a question and answer period I'm going to do my best I'm throwing it open who wants to give me the first question all right well thanks for coming we'll see you <laughs> Emil front row uh, do you track uh, some of the patients that have gone through the rehab program? Uh, do you have any idea of how long some people have lived after their heart event? Right, so the question is, do we track people who graduate from the program and, and what kind of numbers and statistics are we seeing out there? So one of the neat things about our program is uh, the program at Toronto Rehab is one of the largest, oldest, uh, biggest cardiac rehab programs in the world. And while I'm biased, I also like to think it's one of the best rehab programs in the world. Um, we get physicians from all over the world coming to our center to learn how to do cardiac rehab, which is great because we do a, a really good job. Um, We've also got, because we have so many people, researchers from all over the place coming to access our databases, because we've got a lot of graduates that have been through the program, 50,000 people plus, easily. Um, so in terms of tracking them, we do track them for a number of things. There was a, a study that was just done recently that was published in a lot of the major journals. Lead author on that was uh, um, Dr. Paul O oh and Dr. David Alter. Dr. Alter is one of uh, the researchers who works in our center. He's our research chair, actually. And he also works at uh, ISIS next door in Sunnybrook, the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Sciences. And they took a look and they said, okay, People that get referred into our cardiac rehab program, what kind of benefits do they impart? And what they found that is people who are participating in our program and graduate, over the next five years post-graduation, they benefit from a 50% reduction in mortality and morbidity for cardiac causes and all causes of death for five years. So a pretty significant gain. And it's quite interesting, one of the things that the medical director, Dr. O, was always uh, pushing is if you go to a cardiologist and you say, yes, I've got a patient who has had a heart attack, should they be on a statin? Every doctor on the planet will look at you and say, well, that's a silly question. Of course they need to be on a statin. They had a heart attack. You ask the same group of doctors, well, does this patient need to participate in cardiac rehab? And the answer becomes a lot more gray. It's, it's not nearly as pronounced. But when you take a look at the long-term benefits of um, standard cardiac medications like beta blockers, aspirin, and statins, and then you compare um, exercise to that, the benefits are exactly the same. And the incidence of side effects is a lot lower in an exercise program than taking medications. So that's just a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other ongoing research that we do out of the center. The question is, you've been in the program and you've benefited from the program, you're very grateful for that. In the 20 years that I've been doing that, in my opinion, what's, um, what's the part of the program that I, I enjoy the most? I, I can sum that up with a quote from uh, Dr. Kavanaugh. So Dr. Kavanaugh founded the program. Um, he's he's kind of seen as the grandfather of cardiac rehab. He's so well respected in the field. He's got tons of publications. Um, I, I learned at his feet. He hired and trained me. All the respect in the world for him. And one of my favorite quotes directly from Dr. Kavanaugh answers your question quite well. Um, he always said the cardiac rehab was not about putting years onto your life. It was about putting life into your years. So he got into the field and I'm in the field not to make people live longer, we do this to make people live better. As it turns out, cardiac rehab does make people live longer, but that's not why I do it. I, I do it so that people can have their cardiac event, recover from that cardiac event, they can enjoy their lives, they can live with their loved ones, they can travel, they can have fun, and they can do everything that they want to. 
And I can't tell you how many patients finish our program and they come up to me and they say, Rob, even though I had a heart attack, a stent, bypass surgery, I'm in better shape now than I was 5, 10, 15 years ago. That means the world to me. That's why I do what I do. So that's my, my look at it anyway. Frank. How many repeat patients have you got? How many repeat offenders do we get? <laughs> um, we, we actually get a reasonable number of people coming through the program. Um, one of the unfortunate things with heart disease is once you have heart disease, you have heart disease for life. We all know that. It needs to be managed for the rest of your days and that's a, a big part of the reason why we're here tonight. Take Charge is all about helping people manage um, a chronic disease and that of course is, is heart disease. So it's not unusual for people to have repeat events and they do end up coming back. Um, what exactly is the number of repeat customers Customers that we get, I don't have an exact number. It's it's pretty low. Maybe two, three percent of our patients end up coming back. If anyone's curious about that, um, the, the way cardiac rehab works, if you have a cardiac event, um, you're entitled to have that event um, rehabbed. So if you have a heart attack and then you do rehab, and then a year later you need a stent put in, you can come back for rehab. A year later you need bypass, you can come back for rehab. If you don't have a new event you can still come back and participate in the rehab program. Generally speaking, we ask that patients wait a period of at least two years before getting referred back into the program. And ideally, people that come back really need to come back for a, a, a decent reason. So I've got some patients, they've graduated 5, 10, 15 years ago. They're exercising religiously, no problems, doing everything they, they need to do. If they come back to me, I'm not going to be able to do much with their exercise prescription because it's already very, very good. They've been through the program, they don't have any problems, so kind of discourage that a little bit. But if, uh, let's say you've been through the program, graduate, everything's going well, and then you've had hip replacement surgery, or let's say something like that, obviously trying to get back onto the wagon from an exercise point of view is going to need some, some help, some experienced help, and in that case, I'd encourage the person to come back. And in that case, you know, we, we defer the two-year re-referral. Re okay. So Kit was saying she had um, a, a big anterior wall MI, big heart attack 14 and a half years ago. Um, when you have a heart attack, the definition of a heart attack is you kill off part of the heart muscle. And right now with current technology, dead heart tissue is dead heart tissue. We can't do anything to bring that back. So the other half of the heart has to pick up the slack and do the extra work, which makes you tired and makes you fatigued. Um, we also throw a whole bunch of heart medications at you. And those heart medications contribute to people people being tired as well. And I'll try and take a stab at why, because I think that's what you're asking. Um, if you go and you hurt your arm, you can put your arm in a sling and not use your arm for six weeks, eight weeks, let it rest up, let it recuperate, let it heal, and then it could be just as good as it was. If you hurt your hearts with a heart attack, you can't not use your heart. Your heart beats 100,000 times a day. And without it, there's not an awful lot you can do. So we can't get you to not use your heart after you hurt it. The best we can get you to do is to try and rest your heart. And many of the medications that we give you to rest, uh, me, sorry, many of the medications that we give you um, are designed to, to let your heart do as little work as possible. So um, we, we all know Dr. O with his many lectures, talks about medications. Do you guys remember the acronym ASA Beta Statapril? maybe a little bit, and that's kind of the cardiac cocktail of medications that you take. ASA stands for aspirin, ASA. That's not going to do anything to your energy level. It thins the blood, decreases the risk of more cardiac events. It's great. Beta is beta blockers. So beta blockers are the medications that end in O-L-O-L. Metoprolol, atenolol, sodalol, carvedilol, uh, a whole bunch of them. That medication in particular does a number of things to protect the heart. It's great. One of them is it helps the heart rest. So beta blockers slow your heart rate down. Beta blockers lower your blood pressure. The amount of work that your heart's doing at any one time is calculated by finding out how fast it's beating, so the heart rate, and multiplying the rate by the blood pressure that it has to push against. It's something that's called the rate pressure product, from heart rate, blood pressure, and product multiplied together. 
Um, beta blockers really slow the heart rate down, slow the blood pressure down, so your heart can rest. One of the drawbacks to beta blockers in a lot of cases is they're great for the heart and they really slow it down and they keep it nice and calm, but they can also slow down your energy level a little bit too. And they can make you tired, they can make you a little bit sluggish. Bit of a bad rap because while beta blockers will do that and slow you down, a lot of people think, well, I'm really tired and it's all the beta blockers fault. That's not always the case. I mean, the thing you have to remember is if you have a big heart attack, your heart's been damaged, it's weaker, you're not gonna have necessarily the same energy level as a result of the heart problem. And the other thing is we're, we're all getting older. As you get older, a lot of the time you just don't have the same kind of energy and ability to do that kind of work. Um, Stata, statin medications get that rep an awful lot. What's the big side effect that everybody worries about statins? You guys tell me. Muscle, muscle, muscle pains, muscle. right? Yeah, everyone grouses and complains. My doctor put me on Lipitor, now my legs are killing me all the time. Well, guess what? As you get older, your body's gonna start to hurt a little bit more. So it's, it's funny, they did a study taking a look at uh, statin medications, Lipitor in particular. Took like a thousand people, split them up into two groups. 500 people got Lipitor, 500 people got a placebo. And then they went to these people and they said, listen, how are you feeling? The 500 people that took Lipitor, 50% of them said, you know what, that stupid medication is making my legs sore and I got aches all the time because of that medication. Then they went to the 500 guys that took the placebo and you know what, 50% of them said, this darn medication is making me sore and tired, but they were on a placebo. The incidence of true muscle aches and pains with a statin medication is about 1%. So we got, I, I have to do a head count, Cheryl will get a head count for me. We got about 100 people in here, all right? So the statistics show only one of you should legitimately have aches and pains from statins. How many people are convinced they get aches and pains from statins? No, two, you, three, you guys, four, five. So more of you are popping up. So the odds of that are slim. It's possible, it's possible, but the odds are, are pretty slim. So I, I think that answers your question, Kit. A lot of the medications we give you are to let your heart rest, and by letting your heart rest, we do slow you down a little bit as well. That makes you a little bit tired. But it's probably not all just the medications. So that, that's a good comment, and Mike says, there's, there's many things, of course, that will contribute to you being fatigued. One of the big ones is, is anemia. If your hemoglobin's low, hemoglobin is the part of your blood that carries the oxygen, all right? Um, if that starts getting a little bit low, your blood just can't carry as much oxygen. You're tired, you're sluggish, you're lethargic all the time, so that's one. Another big one, um, and Dr. Raytav, who's gonna be our speaker next month, is gonna talk a little bit uh, to this, is sleep apnea. Um, sleep apnea is something that we're finding is a lot more prevalent than we originally thought. Sleep apnea is a situation where you're lying in bed and throughout the entire evening you have periods where you just stop breathing. And you might find in an hour that you've got 40, 45 apneic periods. So 40 to 45 times in an hour you just stop breathing and you might not breathe for 15, 20, 25 seconds throughout the entire night. And you can just imagine how tired you're gonna be when you wake up with that. And that can contribute to fatigue. Sleep apnea also contributes to high blood pressure, arrhythmias, and lots of other cardiac problems. So that's the kind of thing that you'd wanna look at as well. So good question. The comment is going back to Kit. She had this big heart attack 14 and a half years ago. Um, medicine has advanced so much in those last 14 and a half years. Um, is there nothing in place in medicine that we could use to actually um, improve on that situation? We've tried a few things. Um, the, the big one that we're working on right now is stem cell therapy. And you guys see this in the news. And what stem cell therapy is, is uh, all cells, when they're first formed, they don't really know what they want to be. They're like baby cells. and that they, they don't know what they want to be when they grow up. Um, and what we know is if we take stem cells and we put them in the company of other cells, those stem cells will grow up to be the cells that they're near. So what we're starting to do right now is if we can get stem cells and put them in the hearts, well then those stem cells will become new heart cells. And that might be something where you can take the dead scar tissue and have it replaced by healthy tissue from stem cells. So this is something that we've been, we've been researching for, for a bunch of years now. Um, we went through animal models first, and the research in the animal models actually worked reasonably well, well enough that now there are some human trials going on. 
but the trick is we're not sure if it's going to work for sure or if it could do bad things. So the human trials right now are basically in people who have had massive, massive heart attacks, very, very bad damage, and are basically are going to die if you don't do anything. So they're thinking, okay, we're going to try it and see if we can make a difference. Horrible thing to say, but if we do it and the person dies anyway, well, that was their natural progression. So that's something that's coming up. Another thing, uh, mechanical hearts are something that's actually starting to grow a little bit more as well. Uh, if, you've ha if you've had a lot of damage to your hearts and you get to the point where your heart really just can't do any pumping at all, we can put a, a, a pump in the belly that will actually do the work of the hearts. So this is something that in Toronto General, they're doing about 20 or 25 cases a year in people whose heart has been damaged so badly that it just can't support life anymore, basically. Normally a heart contracts and 60% of its contents go out in every heartbeat. Damage the heart to the point where it's maybe 9, 10, 11% pumping, it's just basically moving like this, instead of good, strong, forceful contractions, just weak little pumps. So you can put um, a mechanical turbine in the belly, you stick one tube into the bottom of the left ventricle, the pumping chamber of the heart, another tube into the aorta, and then you've got a little turbine that spins in there, what are on 9,000 RPMs, right Jimmy? 8,800, so at a pretty good clip. And what that does is it sucks the blood out of the heart and then it pushes it up into the aorta and then it gets circulated through the entire body. So this is new technology that if you go back five, six, seven, eight years ago, this would maybe buy you a few months and you had to be in the hospital with it. We now have patients that are four or five years living with this and they're living at home and um, doing a lot of the things, and would maybe argue with me on this one, but doing a lot of the things, a lot of the things that they used to in the past. So there's a lot of advances, but that wouldn't help kits. Because while Kit had a, a pretty big heart attack, she can still function pretty good. And a surgery like this is really, really risky with high rates of, of it not working and the person dying. So you really got to take a look. Is, is your quality of life that bad that you want to take a chance on this? And that's a call that the patient needs to make with the help of their doctor. So the, the, the question was pertaining to sleep apnea and traditionally sleep apnea is managed by what we call CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. And basically what it is, it's, it's a machine that sits on your night table with a hose that goes up to your nose or your mouth and it just constantly blows oxygen into your lungs. So even if you stop breathing, at least you're still getting the oxygen in. It works very, very well. If you've got high blood pressure associated with sleep apnea, the blood pressure comes down. If you're chronically fatigued because you have untreated sleep apnea, your energy level spikes up through the roof almost instantly. Your risk of arrhythmia and dropping dead with untreated sleep apnea, once you treat it goes down, so it works very, very effectively. But a lot of people complain it's cumbersome. You got these tubes in your nose or over your mouth and this whole head apparatus and constant pressure in there and you get dried out and it's a little bit of a hassle. There's also a couple of different types of sleep apnea that you can have. You can have a central sleep apnea, which is a problem with the nervous system. For whatever reason, the nervous system is not working properly, and just every now and then, your brain tells your lungs, hey, take a break, you don't need to breathe anymore, all right? And then you stop breathing, and that's a problem. A dental appliance would not solve that problem. All right, because if you stop breathing, something's got to do the breathing for you and a dental dam won't work. The other type of sleep apnea that you have is obstructive sleep apnea, right? If you're bigger and you, you fall asleep, you've got a lot of extra tissue here, it can push your tongue down and block off the, the air pipe, your pharynx. A dental appliance in that situation actually might help an awful lot because you put that in your mouth and what it does is it pulls the tongue and the jaw forward enough that you can't block that off and then you'll be perfectly fine. So they can work, but it really depends on what kind of sleep apnea you have. It's the same kind of thing with a dental device. A lot of people that have obstructive sleep apnea, if they sleep on their back, it's a problem. They sleep on their side and it's not as big a problem. All right, so they can work, but only in certain situations. Um, the best thing, if, if you're thinking if you've got sleep apnea, if your spouse says, you know, I hear you snoring all the time and they're always smacking you with an elbow, that's a sign that you look, that, that, that's one of the signs they look for for sleep apnea. If your spouse says every now and then, don't hear any breathing, and then you kind of start with this snort, 
that's a sign that maybe you stopped and then the, your, your um, oxygen levels in your blood get low enough that you get this big start to start breathing again. So that's another thing they look for. And the third thing is if you're the kind of person that, you know, we sit you down and within five minutes you can have a little cat nap. Um, if you wake up in the morning and you've, you know, you've been in bed for eight hours and you're just not rested at all, those are other signs that sleep apnea is something that you should look at. What you would do is you'd go to your family doctor and you'd say, hey, listen, this crazy guy Rob at rehab was talking about sleep apnea. And my wife says I'm snoring and every now and then I'm, I'm starting up. Um, we've been working on my blood pressure. I'm tired all the time. Can we have a sleep apnea test? And what they do is they send you to a sleep lab. So you go to a lab. Um, it's covered by OHIP and most of them are covered by OHIP. And then what you do is you just spend the night. They hook you up to a whole bunch of wires and stuff like that and you spend the night and then they actually will monitor your breathing and a bunch of other signals or oxygen concentration in your blood and they'll be able to see yes you have it or no you don't. And if it's, if it's severe obviously you'd want to have it treated. If it's mild they might say you know what you do have a little bit it's not bad enough to be a problem but we need to keep an eye on it. The follow-up comment is uh, Toronto Rehab has got a wonderful sleep lab. It's run by a guy named Dr. Doug Bradley. And for those of you who have been involved with Take Charge for a number of years, he actually came and spoke on sleep apnea, oh boy, maybe six or seven years ago. Brilliant guy, um, one of the world's experts in sleep apnea. And of course, one of the big things with Toronto Rehab is we're always trying to innovate rehab medicine to improve the quality uh, of lives of our patients. And sleep apnea is one of those things where we're trying to innovate. So a lot of stuff coming down the pipe with that. The question was about beta blockers, lowering blood pressure, and can that be a problem? So when, when we talk about blood pressure, we always talk about high blood pressure. Number one risk factor for stroke is high blood pressure, and of course high blood pressure is a risk factor for coronary artery disease as well. You don't want your blood pressure any higher than? 140 over 90. 140 over 90, bang on. What if you're diabetic? That should be 130 over 80. 130, yeah. Gold star, perfect, thank you Mike. So absolutely, uh, upper limit for blood pressure is 140 over 90. If you're diabetic, it's 130 over, over 80. Diabetes does a number of things to the body. One of them is it makes your cells a little bit more fragile. And because your cells are a little bit more fragile, you don't want that pounding from high blood pressure on there, you want it to be a little bit lower. But very few people talk about low numbers for blood pressure. And the reason for that, um, there's no fixed number where low is too low other than maybe zero over zero. That, that would be a problem. <laughs> but um, basically you want your blood pressure to be as low as you can possibly get it and still feel pretty good. Because keeping in mind, one of the reasons we make you guys exercise and we say it's really good for the heart, it strengthens the heart, pushes the heart rate up, makes it work and that makes your heart stronger. But people who exercise on a regular basis have got lower heart rates and lower blood pressures for the other 23 hours throughout the day. And what that goes into, we want your heart to rest and do as little work as possible and that's good. Okay. So in terms of um, low blood pressure, um, everybody can tolerate different things. So um, I, I said I, I work with people who have end-stage heart disease. They've got very, very weak, badly damaged heart, hearts. We want those hearts to do as little as possible. We drive their blood pressure down almost into the toilets. So it's not unusual for us to see blood pressures and my patients on Thursday afternoons of 80 over 50, sometimes down 78, 77. And they don't feel great with that, but they can function, okay? That's good for them. If you give me a blood pressure of 95 over 60, I've got that sleep chair thing you were talking about. I'm out like a light. So there's no hard and fast number. Blood pressure is too low when it causes symptoms that you can't tolerate chronically tired, passing out, really fatigued and lethargic. And I'm not talking about when we first stand up and we get a little woozy for two seconds and then it passes. That doesn't count, okay? When you get to that point, your blood pressure is probably too low. Is that at 105 or 95 or 90? It's different for all of us, okay? So that answers the, the second question. The first question had to do with having a cardiac event and then having to have a procedure afterwards, okay? When you have a cardiac event, you've injured your heart. We want your heart to heal up and recover. When you hurt a heart, it's very irritable, okay? We don't want it to be very, very stressed out. And surgery is something that's very, very stressful. Stress produces stress hormones. Stress hormones creates a toxic environment for the body. 
drives your heart rate up, drives your blood pressure up, um, increases your blood sugar, increases your blood cholesterol, makes the blood thick and pasty, and it makes your heart have a lot of arrhythmia. So we want it to stay nice and calm. Usually if you have a cardiac event, they don't want you to have any major surgery that's elective. If it's urgent, it's urgent, it needs to be done. But any kind of elective surgery, they want you to rest up at least one year after a cardiac event. Okay? And then even after you've had that cardiac events, and then if you want to have another surgery two, three, four years down the road, they're a lot more cautious because you've exhibited, you've demonstrated signs that you've got coronary artery disease and that elevates your risk. You've already got a heart that's been damaged. It's a little bit weaker. It's not perfectly normal. So it does increase the risk. And that's why all the anesthesiologists and the surgeons, whenever they see heart on there, their concern goes up a little bit because it is a little bit of a risk your procedure. Is that and, fair? And, and then they give you things that you normally wouldn't have, drugs and and blood thinners and all kinds of things. So they, 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 will, they will manage you a little bit differently because you're a heart patient, but that's not so much because you're a heart patient. If you've got any other kind of condition, they'll go and take a look at that as well, cardiac or non-cardiac, and then they'll just treat you appropriately. Unfortunately, with your history, you've got a whole list of, of medications that's like a million miles long. So there's, okay, 500,000. But, but there's a whole bunch of other things that they're gonna need to consider for the surgery. Okay? Yes? Can a person die because of sleep apnea? Can a person die because of sleep apnea? Absolutely. A risk of sudden cardiac death because of sleep apnea. I don't know how much greater it is, but it's a significant risk for sudden cardiac death if you have untreated, untreated sleep apnea. And that the risk of sudden cardiac death because of untreated sleep apnea goes away almost entirely the second you start to treat it. So if anybody goes to the sleep lab tomorrow night and starts with CPAP on Saturday morning, your risk drops way, way, way down. It's that quick. And it makes sense, right? Sleep apnea, if you don't breathe for 30 seconds, just imagine the stress that puts on your heart, on your body. And you might do that four or five hundred times a night, every night. It's not hard to see where that risk comes from. Put you on sleep apnea, and that goes away instantly, okay? Can sleep apnea cause headaches? Yes, it can. Um, a lot of the risk associated with the sleep apnea is when you're not breathing, your oxygen saturation levels start to drop. And if that happens en enough, you starve your brain uh, of oxygen and you will get headaches as a result. Absolutely. Headaches can also be caused if you just have a bad night's sleep too, right? If you're tossing and turning all night, you do that two nights in a row, you're not feeling good, you're stressed, that can cause headaches too. So the question is, does it make a difference in terms of what heart medications, um, wh when you take your heart medications? To quote Dr. O, it depends. <laughs> it, de it depends on what the medication is and why you're taking it. So the, the quote that I always remember from, from Dr. O pertains to aspirin. Everyone's taken baby aspirin, right? Pretty much, okay? Baby aspirin works on your blood cells um, when, when they're being formed, and it works for about seven days. So if you take that in the morning or the afternoon or the night, it works for seven days. It really doesn't matter when you take your baby aspirin. Um, but your beta blocker, um, that might only work for 12 hours. So if you're on a beta blocker medication, because maybe you're prone to getting angina, you'll want to take that beta blocker in the morning because you're more active throughout the day and that'll help protect you from angina. And then when you're at night and you're sleeping, you don't need as much protection. If you don't have it then, it's not as big a deal. So it depends on the pill. It depends why you're taking it. And really it depends on, on how long the pill stays in your system. What about warfarin? Warfarin, I don't think it matters so much during the day what time. Um, I think warfarin works for about 24 hours, I believe. Um, so in terms of time of day, that's not gonna matter so much. Um, I, I know if your warfarin level's too high or too low, they tell you to, to, if it's too high, to skip a pill for one or two days and that brings it down quite quickly. So I think that's got a fairly short half-life, about a day or so, I, I believe on that one, okay? <coughs> Strange questions. Um, I have a factor 11 missing in my blood, which means that I'm bleed. prone to bleed. Yes. Should I be taking a baby aspirin? So the question is, we've got an issue with factor 11, which is a, a component of the clotting cascade. Should I take a baby aspirin? I won't lie to you, I haven't got a clue. 
I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. I, I'd be loath to tell you something. Um, I, I just, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, for, for that one, the, the, the clotting process in our body is insanely complicated. And if you talk to Dr. O, he'll give you 100 million words that are 1,000 letters long, 36 different pathways that you can address clotting and stuff like that. All of them, all the, the different blood thinners we take, the aspirin, the plavix, the warfarin, work in different ways. And where factor 11 ties into that chain and where aspirin ties into that chain, I don't have a good answer for that. So that's the kind of one that you'd want to talk to the pharmacist. They might know. If not, family doc, family doc would probably need to get in touch with a hematologist to get that one. But definitely not me. Okay, what else do we got? Yes. So yeah, so so they were taking a look at aspirin as a preventative. Now aspirin's kind of interesting. Um, for a lot, a long time, people used to say, "Hey, once you get to 40 years of age, you should take an aspirin. It's good for you." Um, evidence has shown that's not necessarily the case. Aspirin in primary prevention, so preventing events, has actually not been shown to be very, very effective. In secondary prevention, absolutely. It's a gold standard. You want to take it for secondary prevention without a doubt. Um, in women, women a lot of the time develop heart disease later than men. So as a result, they might need to take aspirin a little bit later. Um, and I think that's where the aspirin comes into. So you need to take it, if you've got coronary artery disease, um, you should be taking it male or female, but I think in terms of primary prevention and taking it earlier on, for women it's unlikely that younger premenopausal women are going to be having heart problems, so you throw a bunch of aspirin at them and it's really not going to help at all anyway. I think that's where that is coming out with. If you've got established coronary artery disease, staple treatment for it is, is aspirin unless you can't tolerate it because of aspirins or maybe factor 11, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But if you can tolerate it, it's a staple. Yeah. Okay, I'm taking a question from the paper here. Okay, how many diabetics do we have? Okay, handful of diabetics. Okay, good. So I had a question from, from a patient and he was wondering, he said, sometimes he go to bed and his sugar's quite reasonable, maybe it's seven or so, goes to bed and then he wakes up in the morning and his sugar is higher. It's like eight or nine, nine and a half, ten or something like that. And he's thinking, well, am I sleepwalking to the fridge and, and feeding myself in the middle of the night or something? How does my sugar creep up like that throughout the night? And one of the things that we know with diabetes is if your sugar starts getting too low, your body starts to get a little anxious and a little antsy about that. It can cause symptoms. Um, it's stressful for the body. Remember the five things that stress hormones do? Number four is it increases blood sugar. So if your blood sugar starts to creep down a little bit in the night, body gets a little bit stressed about that, creates some stress hormone, and that dumps some added sugar into your blood system. And then you wake up in the morning and it can be a little bit elevated. So more than likely, that's probably what's, ha what's happening with that one. Okay emailed me um, a, cu a couple of questions. Uh, wh one of them, I guess I'm going to throw out to you guys. Um, we, we had one of the patients in our, our grad group. So he's involved with a lot of the peer support. He often comes to these sessions. He had a bit of a frightening event, uh, I think it was about three weeks ago now. Um, he was out, he does work with Meals and Wheels. He helps a lot of people out. While he was in his car, he had, his, he had a cardiac arrest. His heart stopped. Um, he was uh, found in his car, slumped over a steering wheel. He's very, very lucky. A passerby saw him, called 911. Um, paramedics and EMS arrived. He was found uh, with no vital signs at all. He was he was dead. Um, they managed to get a, a pulse going and, and revived him. Um, he ended up in the hospital on a ventilator and on ice. They cooled him down to decrease the metabolism and decrease any damage that might be done to the brain because his brain wasn't getting oxygen for a while. Very fortunate, very very fortunate. He survived the events. Did some workups. They they popped a couple of stents and sent him home after I think it was a couple ten days. I think he was in the hospital ten days or so. But very very touchy um, situation for him, and he's recovering. Um, but Mark had a question about that. He said that he had all of these things like power of attorney, passwords, bank information, all the stuff that his wife just didn't have. Um, and he said, you know, is that something that we need to consider? And I thought it was a question that I was going to throw out to you guys. I'm always trying to find topics 
um, for you guys to, to listen. And this is one, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an upbeat, optimistic guy. I'm, I'm a big believer in thinking positive and you'll get positive results. So this is always something that's a little bit uncomfortable to talk about, but end of life planning, power of attorney, all that kind of stuff. Would you guys be interested in me getting a speaker to come and do a session about that kind of thing? I see a lot of I see a lot of heads bobbing up and down. Okay, as, as I said, it's not always the kind of thing that you really want to think about. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of blessed in a sense that working in cardiac rehab, generally speaking, all the people that I've worked with for the last 20 years, they're doing well enough to exercise. So I don't see an awful lot of people in that boat. I do have two patients that I'm working with right now, unfortunately, who have just been uh, assigned into palliative care. And I see a lot of, of head nodding. Do you want to hear about this? Both of them had experiences to spend time with with social workers and talking about end of life planning and they were told there are a lot of things that you want to try and do they were able to do them and they were very grateful that they were able to get it all done so it was done and out of the way and they didn't need to worry about it so a little bit of a touchy topic but if you guys are in agreement I'll see if I can do that in 2014. I should be able to find someone who can come and talk about that kind of thing. I, I have to admit, I don't know an awful lot about this stuff, but what I'm gonna do is, um, we, we've got, now that we're part of UHN, we've got access to Princess Margaret, and they've got some wonderful people who, who talk about that kind of advanced care planning and that kind of stuff. I'm gonna be going through those channels to see if I can find someone who's, who's knowledgeable about the topic. Kit said, as, as, uh, it's good to be optimistic and uh, upbeat. It really is. Um, if, if you believe good things, good things will happen. But you will also need to be real, realistic. Eventually, the end will come for all of us. Death and taxes, it, it's going to happen. So it's, it's there. So, so the comment was, the greatest gift that he got his parents is his parents pre-planned, uh, pre prepaid all of the funeral and end of life stuff so the kids didn't have to fight and argue and, and, and haggle over it. Absolutely. So I'm going to see if I can get someone to come in and, and talk on that. Yeah, so she was just recounting experiences with a family member. The, the, the palliative care services are fantastic. And this is something that I've just learned recently through a few patients. They, they open up an awful lot of doors. So both of the palliative patients that I've been talking to, um, they're still at home, okay? But for example, if they have any problems, there's a phone number that they can call and the EMS will take them directly to a certain hospital, certain floor, certain staff where they know everybody. So there's a lot of really good things because the last thing you want is to be in a point where you're palliative, something bad happens, and then they just bring you to a hospital where they don't know you from a hole in the ground or something like that. So there, there's a lot, a lot of really good stuff to be said about it, and it's the kind of thing it's, it's, it's worth doing. Okay. So, so the comment is, we, we've got a great, very positive, upbeat, upbeat staff, very important. Um, do I have any stats or anything like that about um, being positive and humor impacting on health? I don't need hard numbers. Um, that's a question that we'll, we'll ask Dr. Ray Tav, who's going to be speaking next month. He's going to be talking on the mechanics of breathing, but in terms of positive thinking and all that kind of stuff, he knows all those stats. We do know that laughter reduces blood pressure. Uh, we do know that laughter produces endorphins, which which makes you feel good. Both of those are associated with positive outcomes. So absolutely. Um, for, for positive stories, I, I like to joke. I like to have fun. Um, uh, the atmosphere I create in my classes, I like to think, reflects that. We work with people who have been through life-changing events. Many people, six weeks before I saw them, were in the hospital with wires and tubes hanging out of them. For many people, their first brush with this mortality thing, it's quite frightening. And then you come and you know you're worrying about your heart. Is it strong enough that I can do this work? Can I do this exercise? Will my heart let me down again? Rob's going to make me exercise? I'm, I'm scared to do that. So trying to be positive and upbeat and uplifting um, I think is very, very important and that's something that I push in all of my classes. I try and encourage a lot of peer support, a lot of sharing. I mean, I, I like to think it's good. You guys hear me drone on and on and I know a little bit about a bunch of different things, but I've never had any heart problems. I don't know what it's like to be lying in the hospital with a tube hanging out of my out of my mouth and wires dangling off of my chest. You guys have. So being able to share those stories peer to peer is very, very valuable. That's one of the other things I encourage in the class as well. It's very positive. I'm a big believer that it results in positive outcomes. Exact numbers, Dr. Ray Tavel will have those for you next month. 
So the, the comment is there's a new blood sugar monitor coming out where you will be able to check your sugar and based on the results of the sugar, the monitor will be able to tell you how much insulin you should take as a result of those things. I haven't heard of that myself. I'm happy to see that it's coming out. Um, insulin pumps are something that, that I think are going to be fantastic. So um, for, for diabetics, um, and, and you guys know with diabetes, um, in your body, your body's supposed to produce insulin. Okay? Insulin floats around your body and it basically tells your cells to take sugar out of the blood into the cells where you use it for fuel. Okay? As we get older, stuff wears out, including the cells that produce the insulin. So sometimes we can't produce all the insulin we need. So we need to supplement that. We either take synthetic in insulin injections to supplement it, or we can take oral medications, which maybe will tell the cells to be more sensitive to the little bit of insulin we have, or various other things squeeze the insulin cells a little bit more just to try and get a little bit more. So a variety of different ways to try and get that insulin up. Um, so normally diabetics manage their, their sugars by doing blood samples. Prick your finger, put the blood onto a meter and it tells you how much sugar is in there and then you use the medication, your diet and you try and manage it that way. Insulin pumps are things that you end up wearing on your belt and it's got a, a needle with a wire that goes into your body just underneath the skin and it ends up measuring your sugar in the blood on a fairly regular basis and then you can tell what it is and then you tell the pump okay well my sugar is reading this high um, you should put in this much insulin the technology exists that this should almost be done automatically where you can put the pump in there and the software will go and program itself that it will check the sugar and then it'll be able to tell you how much insulin and the technology is almost to the point where it can mimic what a natural physiologic system would be. That's where we're going because for diabetics to decrease the risk associated with diabetes, they need to control the sugars well. It's counting carbs, it's taking your medication, it's doing it, it, it all properly. It can be complicated. If that can be automated through technology, the outcomes are going to be an awful lot better. So all of that stuff, it's, it's coming. I haven't heard of this pump per se. I don't work an awful lot with diabetics firsthand. If we were to talk to um, Renee Kanidis, who manages our diabetes program next door, or even better, Dr. Michael Sarin, who manages the diabetes program, they might have a better feel for it. They're a little bit more up to speed on that technology than I am. So Frank's comment, happy-go-lucky guy, but he's had this advanced care planning with wills and the kids and everything like that done for quite some time, and, and that's, that's fantastic. Um, as, as the other comment was, it, it saves a lot of headaches, because I do see that where patients come through and their, their mother, their father has passed away, and it's like, okay, it's unfortunate they passed away, but maybe they were like 102 years old, so it was expected. It's not the stress of losing the parents, it's the stress of fighting with the other siblings and family members over a state and all those kind of things. So having that stuff settled will save your kids an awful lot of work. Absolutely. So, so Emil's question is, when we give an exercise prescription, we'll say go this many miles and this many minutes and this will result in a heart rate of between X and Y and that provides a, a good training effect. I do that for maybe an hour. But what if I were to go out golfing for four or five hours? The volume is so much greater, but the effort's going to be a lot lower. My heart rate will be significant less. Is that good and bad? So that really goes to the concept of um, metabolic versus cardiovascular fitness. So we, for the longest time in rehab, have been real big advocates of cardiovascular fitness. All right, we've been pushers saying go this far, this fast, it gets your heart working at a level that puts us enough stress on it that it will respond to the stress by becoming a healthier, fitter, more efficient pump, stronger organ, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that over the years we really haven't done an awful lot of we're starting to change that a little bit more, is the concept of metabolic fitness. Probably 90% of the benefits that, you come, that, that come from exercise are based on volume. So if you want to lose weight, you don't have to go super, super hard, but you've got to go longer. If you want to improve your cholesterol, longer. You want to lower your blood pressure, longer. Sugar control, longer. So there's many, many, many benefits that impact our health in a very positive way pretty much all of the risk factors for coronary artery disease and they're all based on volume of exercise. So going out and golfing, seven days a week, four or five hours, I don't know how it would be for the stress level, but that would be great for so many risk factors. But 
the one thing that volume of exercise does not do is it does not put a big enough load on your heart to increase that muscle, okay? If I only ever lift a piece of paper, my bicep's not going to get any bigger. Even if I lift this a million times, I'm just not loading my bicep enough. It doesn't need to get any bigger. It doesn't need to get any stronger. It's the same idea with your heart. If you just putter along at a very slow pace, you're not asking your heart to do any work. It's a wonderful organ, but it's lazy. It's only going to be as strong as you ask it to be, which means you do need to ask it to do some work on a regular basis, which is your way of telling your heart, get stronger, okay? One of the concepts that's coming out, uh, well, it's not coming out, it's been out for a long time, but it's, it's gaining more popularity, is something called HIT training, high intensity interval training. All right, so this is the concept of going for maybe three or four minutes, nice and casual, easy ozy, and then just going as hard as you possibly can for a minute and just pushing super, super hard and then going slow for a few minutes and then super, super hard for a minute. This is what world-class athletes do. They put that, that minute of real high intensity exercise on their heart so their heart and their body knows what it works, knows what it's like to work super, super hard and it will restructure itself and and it'll adapt itself to handle the stress of high intensity exercise. It'll make itself very, very fit. It's a great concept for the regular population. It might be starting to get a little bit of traction with cardiac population, but we're still not sure if it's safe. And you guys know that. We tell you to do a warm up, we tell you to do steady state exercise, so same intensity for a block of time, and then go and cool down. Why? So that your heart knows what's coming. We put a load on it that's appropriate and it'll make it a stronger organ. But you don't want to shock your, your heart, especially if it's been damaged 14 and a half years ago, 50% of it's gone. We don't want to shock the heart. High intensity training is, is it's got a shock element to it. They're starting to do it in very uncomplicated, low risk cardiac patients. Because one of the things that we know is high intensity interval training will improve your cardiovascular fitness. So you know your VO2, stuff in that tube in your mouth? High intensity interval training will increase your VO2 better than any other type of exercise training out there. There's nothing better. One of the best predictors for how long you're going to live is how high your oxygen consumption is. All right. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. And we know that holds true for the regular population. It also holds true for the cardiac population. We push your oxygen consumption up, you're, you're that much likelier to live longer. If we do high intensity interval training, we can push that value higher and you'll live longer. What we're not 100% sure is, is, is a heart that's been damaged able to tolerate the stress associated with that? So there's a lot of research coming out with that. It's, it's interesting stuff. So we, we do interval training, so the question is about different types of interval training and the intensity. So we do interval training at rehab. If there's anybody here, and I know there's a few people that have progressed to a walk jog, that's interval training. I know on my Thursday, my very low level class, I have patients walk for a little bit and then they rest and they walk and then they rest. That is interval training as well. That type of interval, interval training is generally done with the steady state exercise at maybe 65-70% of your maximum and the higher intensity stuff at maybe 80-85% of your maximum. The high intensity interval training involves what they call super maxes. So you would go at 75% of your max for 3-4 minutes and then you'd go at 105-110-115% of your max for 1 minute. Literally, you finish that minute and you're puffing like a bellows. I tried to do it earlier in the summer on the Schwinn, which is the bike with the arms. I'd go for five minutes, nice and moderate, and then I'd go as hard as I could for a minute. Darn near killed me. <laughs> and I don't want touch wood, no heart problems. It's very, very challenging to do. So while we do interval training at rehab, and what you, what you mentioned is interval training, it's a lower intensity uh, type of interval training. The stuff we're talking about is really, really high intensity. 
so Mike's question, we get asked this a fair bit. If, if I give you a prescription that's to walk an hour, um, five times a week, and you say, ah, I don't have time to do the hour, I'm gonna do 15 minutes here, 20 minutes there, 30 minutes there, is that equivalent? In terms of cardiovascular fitness, it's close enough that it'd be hard to nitpick a difference. Um, the only thing that I ever take a look at that is sometimes with energy metabolism, when we're exercise training you at a level that's gonna give cardiovascular conditioning, a lot of the time, um, you're exercising at a level that, that burns muscle glycogen, so fuel stored in the muscles. Once you go for about 30 minutes or so, a lot of that's depleted, and then you start tapping into fat stores. So a lot of the time with my heavier patients, I'll encourage them to try and do the exercise in one fell swoop. I just feel they'll burn a little bit more fat that way. If I have patients where body composition is not an issue, and then generally I'm not gonna argue with that. Uh, it, it's perfectly fine to do that. So, so David's comment, when he was in the program with me, he did a lot of walking, he was doing fantastic on the bike, right, doing great. And then every time he seemed to get a little bit stronger, I came after him with a new prescription, pushed him a little bit harder. And he's thinking, wait a minute, you know, should I really be doing this? Um, Exercise improves your cardiovascular fitness. Uh, generally speaking, we train most of our patients at about 75 to 80% of their maximum fitness level. So when you came in, that's when I started. And then you did it and it worked and your maximum fitness level increased. So the exercise you were doing was no longer 75 or 80% of your max, it was now maybe 60, 55, 50% of your max. If we wanted to improve your fitness level, we need to push the intensity back up to that 75 and 80%, which is why we keep increasing the exercise prescription like we do. So then David commented and he said, so now I've graduated off the program, is that the kind of thing that I should be looking to do as well? It's the kind of thing that you should be looking to consider. When our patients graduate off the program, one of the things I tell them is, look, you guys are checking your heart rates on a regular basis. You know what your heart rate's supposed to be. If six months down the road you're doing your thing and you know your heart rate's two or three or four beats lower than it usually is, you probably improved your fitness level, which is great. And if you improved your fitness level, it means that you probably should try and improve the exercise you're doing as well. So you should consider maybe pushing it up a little bit. A better way to get that answer, though, is to take advantage of the pulse check service that we offer. Right? And you guys know this, once you graduate off the program, if you'd like, on a yearly basis, you can come back and we will do another cardiovascular stress test on you. We'll check your oxygen consumption, heart rates, and all those values, and then we'll sit down with you and we'll say, listen, what are you doing? What kind of heart rates are you getting? And then we'll compare that to your stress test to make sure that the heart rates are in the right range. And we can also, based on what you're doing, make sure that you're 75 to 80% effort-wise based on the oxygen consumption as well. Okay. No, I didn't do that. I went through that. But Good. There was no change. Right? There, there was no change. Nobody said you should be doing something different. Right. So, so David said he went through that, and they said what you're doing is fantastic. We'll, we will all, in terms of fitness, we'll all hit a plateau at, at some point. Otherwise, all it would take is effort, and we all be world class athletes. <laughs> There's genetics that come into play, right? You will eventually come up to the ceiling with your cardiovascular fitness, and then you'll truly go into a maintenance level of exercise where you'll keep the same thing long term, and that will work perfectly fine. Possibly that you, you did hit that maintenance level. Because I do remember your last test with me, your fitness level was through the roof. It was very, very high. Um, I don't know how much more it could have pushed, so I would not be surprised if you just hit that same level and you're just on a plateau, in which case your exercise can plateau as well. It's, it's the thing we're starting to see, I mean, 20 years ago when I started working here, when we saw patients in their early 70s, they were old, okay? Um, I, I've probably got half a dozen patients that are in their 90s on the program right now. I've got one lady and, and she's puzzling to me right now. I'm looking at her exercise prescription. She walks a mile and a half. She does it in 30 minutes. Um, at the YMCA, she does that six days a week. She does um, uh, aerobics programs on top of that. She does her weights. Fantastic. And I'm looking at the prescription. I'm thinking, do I want to increase her prescription? She's 93. <laughs> she's 93 years old and I'm just looking at her. She's, she's doing this absolutely fantastic. And I can't get through my head that she's 93. If I didn't look at her age, I'd bump her up to two miles, two and a half, and I'd push her up to three miles. But I'm, I'm looking at that 93, and how can you do that? And she said exactly the same thing you did. She says, I've been doing this my whole life. And I see more and more people who say, well, I did it yesterday, I can do it today. And if I did it today, I can do it tomorrow. 
And if you take that line of thinking from 35 or 40 years of age, you end up being 90 years old, walking a mile and a half in 30 minutes and thinking, well, I did it yesterday, why can't I do it today? So that stuff's fantastic and it's, it's very, very possible. So, so the comment is, you know, if you've led an active lifestyle and everything's fantastic, you enjoy that and that's great, and then all of a sudden problems creep up, blow out a knee, sciatic back, wreck a hip, something like that, the frustration gets really, really bad with that. And I, I mean, I, I always said it's, it, it's one thing when you get, you know, a 65-year-old guy who's had a heart attack, a massive heart attack, he's destroyed his heart and he can't really do much of anything, but he was a couch potato who smoked his whole life and never really did anything anyway. Um, that, that's one thing, but when you get someone who's been active of their entire life and done everything and then they have a heart problem or something happens and they can't do it anymore it's, it's much bigger loss um, and it is very very frustrating in terms of doing that you just need to see if you can channel your energies into other things that you know are healthy behaviors and try and do them so I mean if, if you can't walk maybe you can get on a bike if you can't do the biking, maybe you can get into the pool. Um, if you can't get into the pool, maybe you can do some weightlifting or something like that. You just need to see if you can find other things to channel that energy into. It's sometimes hard to do that, um, you know, especially if you have significant problems all over that really decrease your mobility. But you got to look and you, you got to keep trying. You know, I've always said I'm, I'm positive. I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, your, your brain plays a huge role in that because the second in your mind you actively decide that's it, I can't do it anymore, the game's truly over at that point. If you don't ever get to that point, it might hurt and you might not be able to do it much, but you'll still be able to keep going. You really, really, really got to not make that negative switch. When that happens, you're in, in trouble. So even if you're walking slowly through pain, you're, you're better than not. Yeah. You're not going to injure yourself. You're are, just gonna... are, are, are you better walking slowly with pain? You're not going to injure yourself? It depends. If you've got arthritic knees and you're walking with arthritic knees, you're, you're wearing them out a little, bit, a little bit more. But the flip side is if you've got arthritic knees and you don't do anything, you're, you're destined to have more heart problems. Um, I'd much rather try and avoid the heart problems and hope I have a healthy, st healthy heart and be strong enough with all my other systems that if I do need orthopedic surgery, I, I can handle it. So, I mean, my job is always really, really easy. The answer is always exercise. It, it is. Okay. I've got time, there was, was there one more back there? No, okay, exercise is good, I think that's, okay, Frank, it better be a good, good one, Frank, because this is the last one. Okay, the, problem, the question is, does Viagra help the heart? <laughs> Alex, I think we'll edit that one out of the video. Okay, does Viagra help the heart? No. No. So the, 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 problem, the problem with Viagra is it can cause blood pressure problems. So for many of you are on medications to keep your blood pressure low and Viagra can make that worse and it can make it dangerously low and you can get yourself into trouble. So if you're on any kind of cardiac medications, especially anything that impacts on blood pressure and you're looking at using Viagra or something like that, it's very, very important that you talk to your physician because you can get yourself into a lot of trouble with that in all seriousness. Okay. And on, on that note, okay, <laughs> I think I think we'll. It was a good one. It was a good note to end on. Okay, thank you, Frank. <laughs> So I think we'll wrap things up. Um, our next session is going to be is it November seventeenth, Cheryl? It's the third Thursday in November. Um, there's a change in topic. Initially, we were going to have Dr. Bradley Strauss, who's the head of cardiology at Sunnybrook, come and talk in November, and he was going to talk about a new procedure that he's been working on, where you're injecting an enzyme into a fully blocked coronary artery, which softens the blockage enough that you can pass a wire and put a stent in. Because normally if you've got a fully blocked artery, you can't do that. He's found a way around that. So really exciting stuff. But unfortunately something came up and he had to cancel. He did promise that he would speak for us in 2014. So he's going to be one of our talkers, one of our speakers in the, in the first half of 2014. He's committed to that. So pinch hitting for Dr. Strauss is going to be Dr. Ray Taff. Many of you know Dr. Ray Taff. He's our psychologist next door um, in the cardiac rehab program. And he's going to be coming and talking about the proper mechanics behind breathing. 
something many of us take for granted, but a lot of us don't do it properly. So that's going to be his session. It's going to be very, very interesting. He's going to give everybody a lot of tips to determine, are you more of a chest breather, which is bad, or a belly breather, which is good. So you'll be able to assess what kind of a breather you are. He'll go over some of the research saying why you should be a belly breather. And he'll also give you a bunch of tips that will help you become more of a belly breather. So that's going to be happening. That is the third Thursday in November. And it's going to be here. So please come for that. If you guys get a chance, Cheryl, remind me. We're going to send out an email to everybody to show you how to support the YouTube channel. We really want that because then we can get it live stream. If you ever miss a session, you'll be able to see it, no problems. And do go and take a look at our YouTube page as well. We've got tonight's session will be up there, last month's session will be up there, and Cheryl's also updated it with lots of really great videos um, that are all from the health community pertaining to heart health. All right, folks, we got snacks out in the hallway. Enjoy, and that's, uh, that's it for tonight. <laughs>